Welcome, hi. Welcome to another FITA Museum Instagram Live. I am waiting for my colleague, let's see, Christina to join me. I'm looking for her, oh, there she is. I'm going to, oh gosh. I'm, I'm failing, I'm failing. Hold on a second. Let me um, see if I can invite her to join. Christina, there you are. Okay, um, go live with Christina. Christina, I'm waiting for you. Here I am. <laughs> there we are. We did it. I think I forgot how to do this. <laughs> the most important step, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, good morning, Christina. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Good morning. And I'm so happy to see people logging on to join us for another FITA Museum Collection Conversation. Exactly. And I know this is like part two of our uh, research discussion. So we are, of course, open to your questions about research in general, how, how to conduct it, um, just pointers, but we did have um, a different reason for uh, sharing our research today. Yes, we're going to be sharing some in-progress research topics uh, that Lee and I have both been working on. And um, we're also going to attempt to talk about this concept of reparative scholarship. And I'm going to aim to define that in just a moment. But before I do, I would like to acknowledge that I have fallen short in um, centering the creative expressions and the contributions of people of color uh, in my research. And I spent time thinking about my own inherent biases. Um, I do intend to engage in more reparative scholarship and I'll define that. I define reparative as literally fixing something, repairing something, making amends. And that starts with the fact that people of color have been uh, marginalized and excluded from fashion history discourse and narratives. And of course, this is nothing new for people who are joining us um, today to know. Um, so that's really what I wanted to start off with. I know that I have specific steps that I can take to help do this work. And we're going to attempt to have a conversation about this. Um, Absolutely. The conversation today. Yeah. And I have to set, I have to echo your sentiment. Um, I think that a lot of white privileged people in this field have um, a lot of have, have dealt with a reckoning really um, that has been sparked by a whole multitude of, of factors. I also acknowledge that in my work for the museum field, as well as in my own personal research, um, I have fallen short as well. And th some of the factors that have made me have a, a, a real awakening were the events of 2020. Um, you know, the social awakening and Black Lives Matter movement, as well as indigenous peoples becoming more visible, vocal, um, people of Asian American descent. There have been so many ways to spotlight the injustices in our society and also having a pandemic happen at the same time pointed out social inequities as well as gave me time gave me the gift of some quiet time to not be so busy doing the daily ins and outs of life to step back and have to have the time to think about the world at large my perception of it and how I can do what I can to right the wrongs like you were saying repair um, so it gave that that experience was a, a silver lining that it's it's been able to give us the time to think about how we can meaningfully um, step forward and advance stories that are universally uh, resonant. So that I, I am with you on this. Um, I, I, I want to do better. I want to push myself to look harder. And that's that's something that we both can agree as well is a product of our education. Um, you know, there were a lot of things I learned in school and learned on the job, but I didn't always center those, those narratives, those creators, and it's time. It's time to think more um, cohesively about 
for me, I, I, I'm focus, focused a lot on the 20th century in America. So it's, it's really, it really was a wonderful and stimulating opportunity to start to really look at a bigger picture. And I also want to state the obvious that we are two uh, white people who are navigating through this concept of reparative scholarship or reparative history. And mm -hmm. we want to state that we are learners and we are not leaders. We uh, right. believe that our peers, scholars of color, um, if they um, are interested in working uh, on, on these topics, um, on this issue, then we will follow their lead. And um, so I, I also want to acknowledge that as we navigate this and try and be very honest mm -hmm. with this aspect of research that um, a lot of people are, are talking about. So hopefully the topics we have chosen today will be good talking points and we're gonna do our best to pay attention to the questions also that are being asked. So without uh, further pause, I'm mm -hmm. going to start with an object-based analysis of something that just came in. And it's, I, I, bear with me, I have some um, notes and papers because it is works, a work in progress. So I am gonna be looking down a little bit. <laughs> Don't but, worry, um, <laughs> you have no idea how many things I have spread around me here. I'm gonna be like zipping in and out and being You like, should oh, see my desk with all the papers everywhere. <laughs> but anyway, the piece I'm going to be talking about is this dress. It's a yellow silk gauze dress dating to the 1810s. And I'll show you a detail of it right here. Here is a detail. And I'm gonna get really mm -hmm. close so you can see. It's gossamer, it has a sheen. It was obviously a very expensive textile because it has been uh, put together salvage to salvage. So this is going mm -hmm. to be the focal point of what I'm going to be speaking about. And the dress was kindly donated by an amazing donor to the Fitton Museum, Stephen Porterfield, who has been so generous with giving over the years. I have to say that this is a piece that has allowed me to think about a lot, a lot of things. So I'm going to walk um, everyone through that. So what's, what's interesting is that sometimes we get pieces in the collection, they come with little notes, like little pieces of paper, little <laughs> notes. And this is obviously something that was not written during the time when this dress was worn. It was written much later in the later 20th century. And I'm going to read it. Um, it says, second day dress worn by Augusta Dubois with her dates of 1797 to 1854 upon her marriage to Charles Elliot Mickey in Boston in 1817. So I look at that dress and I think, you know what? Yeah, I think it does date to about 1817. But the researcher in me wants to double check every single name and every single date to make sure because you can't always believe you know, what you read. So I go um, onto Ancestry.com, which is what I like to call Google stalking for historians. Right. There's so <laughs> many amazing um, documents, everything from census information to birth certificates, marriage certificates, mm -hmm. and it does it does pan out. I do want to say there was a little bit of um, I think there there's a little a couple of issues, but what I found is that Augusta Dubois, who was actually born in 1796, so not 1797 um, as written on that envelope, she died in 1854. She married a name uh, a guy named Charles Elliot McGee, and there was a spelling issue. So on the on the little paper here, it says McGee, M-C-G-E-E, -E, but the last name was actually M-A-G-E-E, -E, and they were married in October of 1819. So seeing this yellow dress, I think, yeah, you know what? I think this is 1819, and what a second day dress is, is the dress that was worn um, either immediately after the wedding ceremony or the next day. So this was worn in, in October of 1819. Now, in order to find out more about her life, I would need access to archives, so papers or images or photographs. And in order to leave an archives, someone needed to have been literate, first of all. They also needed to have saved their correspondence or diaries, and then a family member needed to have saved that. And then an archive or an institution needed to have assigned a value to that so that it could also be saved. I wasn't able to find anything for Augusta. Literally, the only thing I found for Augusta is her tombstone, which is difficult to see, but here is her tombstone in Massachusetts. So what is left of Augusta's life right now, tangibly, is a dress and a tombstone. And by the way, the dates, I'm not going to you know, read it, but they do line up with what else I have, I have found. The other way we learn about um, females oftentimes is through their male relatives. And her male relatives mm -hmm. left a lot of information. Um, they left architecture, her um, husband's father lived mm -hmm. here during the time they were married, which is actually now the Shirley Eustace house. 
just outside of Boston. So she would have um, visited that. And what I found through archives is that her husband, um, uh, Charles, Charles McGee, his father, James uh, McGee, were both mariners. They were both um, cap ship captains. They dealt with a lot of cargo. And so her father-in-law was actually business partners with a man named Charles H. Perkins. And he left a huge amount of information. And actually here he is right now, right here. This is Charles H. Perkins. So her like uncle by marriage, essentially uncle-in-law by marriage. And here he is uh, painted by Gilbert Stewart. This hangs in the oh. Boston Athenaeum. He was also painted by Sully. He was also um, daguerreotyped by South Rith and Haas. So, wow. you know what? He left a, a big record. Yeah, he was, he was, he was well, yeah, some people would think he was important. And history <laughs> certainly has assigned importance to him. Mm -hmm. So um, her father-in-law and uh, James McGee and uh, John uh, Perkins. They actually formed a company together called Perkins and Co. And they were the first Americans to visit Canton in China, which was the only open port at that point. And they imported tea and they also imported silks. And so I went to my favorite newspapers.com right here. And I actually found some ads from um, 1819 in New York. So they um, went from Boston to China and then to New York to sell their wares. And it says um, the silks from Mr. Perkins and Co., um, from Canton were chosen especially for their quality and um, with very liberal terms and the catalog will be ready next week. So um, basically this silk must have been imported by either Augusta's husband, her father-in-law, or her uncle-in-law. Thus she was a walking advertisement for their wares. Now in the past I think that I would have stopped my analysis there and you can see that I'm centering my analysis on this white woman of privilege. However, there's a lot more to be examined about this, um, about this project. We can center our research on the textile itself. What were the lives like of the Chinese farmers who dealt with the silkworms or the weavers or the um, Chinese uh, merchants or traders who trade, who traded with these Americans? For something like that, I think I would go, um, I would start with the Fashion and Race Database, which was founded by Kimberly Jenkins at Ryerson University. She works with an amazing team and they have both primary and secondary sources and object analysis, including uh, Chinese information uh, that I can start. I can start and try and understand this dress from another perspective, um, mm -hmm. from a perspective that has not, has not been um, centered before. I also want to bring up that Charles Perkins from Perkins & Co. He was the number one importer of opium into China. Okay, so he oh, would import, wow. and that was illegal. That was illegal and it caused mm -hmm. a lot of suffering and a lot of instability. He was also the second richest man in the United States at that time after John Jacob Astor. So he had so much money. Mm -hmm. He founded the Perkins Institute for the Blind. As I mentioned, he was a donor to the Wadsworth, mm -hmm. um, excuse me, the Boston Athenaeum. Uh, he also invested mm -hmm. in railroad. So I started uh, looking a bit more into his life again because I wanted to understand exactly where this wealth this privilege that Augusta would have experienced derived from He has a lot of papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society uh, Including a copy uh, and thank goodness it's digitized right in this era We live in a digitized yeah. world so we can access these objects uh, these digitizations the memoir of Thomas H. Perkins which was written in 1856 so in in 1785 he was about 20 and quote, uh, this is written in the second person, he was advised to pass the winter in a warm climate and he visited his elder brother in Saint-Domingue. They formed a house which was very successful. Hmm. This gives me pause because Saint-Domingue, uh, which is now Haiti, it was hmm. a major site of enslavement um, of African people. It was a French colony, a colony that dealt with um, crops of sugar and coffee. And I wondered, well, what, what is he doing here, right? Mm -hmm. So reading on, it says uh, later in seven, and, and by the way, he was working with his brothers there. And this was such a family business. Everyone um, was working on this. So later in 1792, uh, after Thomas had left Saint-Domingue, uh, Saint his brother, his, one of his other business partners, quote, escaped a perilous situation and lost his property on the island. And this is a way of kind of talking around the fact that 
these brothers, this family, were there during a mm -hmm. revolution led by enslaved individuals against their white colonizers, uh, in which they self-liberated. So, um, you know, Augusta's family wealth derived in part from railroad, in, in part from trade, in part from illegal opium smuggling, in part by um, making a profit off of enslaved individuals. There are also records that Thomas Perkins did make, um, uh, made money off of re, uh, reselling enslaved individuals. It was really lucrative. So now we have this piece, this piece here, right? That it functions as this liminal point between beauty Absolutely. and the unjust. And this is the power of fashion and scholarship is talking about these truths and these really complicated histories. I want to make sure that I acknowledge the work of a scholar who I've been following. He has done work on um, Haitian history. He has a new digital initiative called Rendering Revolution, Sartorial Approaches to Haitian History. It's Dr. Jonathan Square, and he's very well known for his um, work on fashioning the self in freedom and slavery and his work on um, African diasporic fashion. Oh. So this is an example of um, a journey I took with this dress and going that, just expanding it, expanding the narrative. And I, I learned a lot and I'm, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to have the support of the FITA Museum, the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising to do these types of analyses and to think critically about right. these problematic histories in our field. Right, and I think it's, a, a, it's exactly like you say, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful object in and of itself. It can be interpreted on the most basic level of commerce and trade and Chinese export materials and early American culture. Or you can dig deeper and use this as an opportunity to, to share with your audience, um, whether that's through social media or whether that's in our galleries someday, um, a further story that really allows people to consider things just the, in a way that they may not have the opportunity to think about unless perhaps you point that out or, you know, a scholar points that out. Um, and I, I, I'm sure this is the case for a lot of um, wealthy American, early American families, especially in port areas like Boston and New York, that their, their success and, and the names that you would see on buildings and uh, municipal projects and things like that have a, uh, kind of some difficult backstories that we all benefit from knowing. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to take away from our appreciation of the object itself. And that's something that I am, I'm, I'm gonna sort of tell you a little bit about things I'm researching. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm less, I'm less a, a further along than you are in terms of the narration of a story. But I, it's, there's some things percolating in my head as I research American fashion um, that I, I know that I'm on a journey as well. I, having always been a lover of vintage clothing and fashion, um, I, I know that there have been periods in my life where I have not questioned what I am looking at hard enough. Um, I know that there, I, there are prints, for example, um, from the mid-century period that are really actually quite ugly if you start to really think about them. Um, so one example that I have, and this is using um, a, a piece that we have in our special collections, but that I actually happen to have a, a, a copy of at home. And this is uh, one of my favorite resources, period resources um, that I, I turn to to find out about what was happening in the American fabrics industry. So this is an American fabrics magazine. It's oversized and a little bit delicate, so I'm gonna um, show you some printouts that I made from it. It's the winter 1952-53 issue. And this is um, focusing on an American fashion designer, um, Carolyn Schnurrer, who's um, someone who's you know not a household name, but was very popular in the period. And one of the things that she was particularly known for um, was traveling and resourcing ideas from different parts of the world. So this this particular volume um, shows, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to move that, um, shows her trip to Africa and the, all of the resources and amazing things. And 
I, I have had this magazine for many years and you've had it in the collection for many years. Um, I've looked at it before and didn't, didn't necessarily trigger any problems for me. But, you know, here's the first page of the article. And it has a very colonialist depiction of Carolyn doing field research. Um, the second time that I, or not the second time, but in, in reappraisal, um, I started to look at this and feel very uncomfortable about mm -hmm. the fact that, first of all, I had never challenged this in my mind and that I had certainly let this idea of um, research, the, the, the idea of sourcing from different cultures and different materials. And what is uh, that? Is that the other page? I'm sorry. This is, this is, these are pages, excuse me. I'm so sorry. These are pages from her notebooks. So I there see. are different, different sketches that she, she drew and with her notations, they basically published uh, many pages from her, from her um, notebooks and also um, just notes from her notebook and as well as fabric samples as well. And, and the companies that she worked with but you know, I I I'm still working through in my mind the ideas about cultural appropriation, inspiration, misappropriation. There's a lot of of concepts and words and thought processes that I'm still going through. This is an image of a swimsuit in denim with trunks and a fitted bra. And it is inspired by the jacket of a house of boy in the background. Mm -hmm. These are the types of things that I encounter a lot in my research. And now I'm, I feel aware of the fact that we cannot, as, as people who love fashion, just, you know, point to something and say, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. It's so cute. I would love to wear it. We can't just do that. We need to examine things and we need to say, I, I, I need to know how does a person from th this culture feel about this? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've struggled myself because I, I do think that there is a certain amount of <laughs> world global um, fashion history and textile history that it, it, you cannot escape the concept of borrowing. Um, it can be done respectfully and it can be done uh, terribly but I, I've always appreciated that and thought oh it's really amazing to see connections um, from this ornament from this part of the globe winding up on a Carolyn Schnurr outfit um, for example but I, I also think that romanticizing and fetishizing cultures for the sake of Western fashion isn't something that we can just ignore and um, I grapple with how do, how do people of African descent, African Americans, Black Americans, how do they feel when they see images like this? Um, and then they go, they go un, unexamined in our culture. Uh, I, I want to start to be able to think more clearly about this and also find the right um, scholars to, mm -hmm. to discuss this material with. Um, I have been uh, successful in connecting with um, Janet M. Purdy, who is a, um, a scholar on African pattern and adornment. So I have been having some conversations with her about um, the, the, the original material and how it fits with the fashionable interpretation. And she shared with me some resources. I think that the more you can get outside of your own appreciation for like cute vintage fashion, the better it is for society in in general. I don't I don't ever want to wear something that somebody is offended by. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to um, provide a it, something to see at a museum that doesn't come with a context and a way to maybe shift thinking, shift, shift those thought processes. So yeah, that's I, um, I one thing that I'm, yeah, sorry. I share those thoughts and I think that we're lucky and that more scholars and more historians 
are doing research on their own cultures. So that's what I mean by being learners and not leaders to making sure that I reach out to those scholars that I search it out and do that, put that time in. Um, we're also lucky in that we live in this digital age where many people uh, have social media accounts like Instagram, where, where we're talking right, right now. And it makes people uh, more accessible, I think, when you reach out and ask them. Another issue to talk about is, yes, it's very important to follow the lead of scholars who are studying their own um, histories and cultures, as well as audience members who are appreciating that. But when we're talking about historians and scholars, we need to make sure that, um, that we're remunerating them for their time. Right. Um, it's one thing Absolutely. if it's a nonprofit endeavor, but if someone is a scholar and I am making use of their time, I want to make sure that um, I'm acknowledging that tangibly uh, financially or perhaps trading information, always making sure that it's uh, an, an even exchange of knowledge. I think that is key as well. And um, it is it's a it's something that I know that you and I both feel a bit um, sh not sheepish about, but we acknowledging that perhaps we are not, I mean, I know that I'm not the, the keeper of this knowledge. I want to help share the knowledge, but I know that there are uh, people from cultures that have firsthand experience with design, their, their design history to teach me. And I will like, like, as you said in the beginning, um, I will follow their lead. I'm a learner, not, 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 I'm not the person to say I'm the expert on African fashion and culture. I want to always be very transparent in saying this is not my uh, area of extreme knowledge. And I just want to soak up what I can from, from people of color who have direct experience with their cultures and can help me see their culture in the way that it should be. Because there is a joy in learning about other cultures and any of the research topics we choose. Um, yeah, and I think at the end of the day, it's all about connecting with other people. We connect with the people who read our research or who visit our exhibitions and we wanna connect with other um, scholars and researchers too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and collaboration is always more rewarding than trying to be the, the person who plants their flag on a subject and says, oh, I'm no, the expert. no, 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 I know no this. one owns a topic, right? No one owns no. a topic, please. No, no, no. no. And, and it's, 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 um, it's, I think it's so simple to be able to acknowledge somebody else's strengths and, and their abilities and what you can learn from them without diminishing what you do. So that's something else that within research as a, as a general topic, um, being able to give credit and acknowledgement to your sources and with, with, in fact, with enthusiasm, I think is something that can be um, an example for all scholars in all fields that it, it, it's, if, if we all shine together, it's, it's just a more harmonious world, <laughs> not, to, not to be so selfish about um, and protective about research. And I want to um, talk about the word scholar because I think that sometimes that can seem elitist. I actually think of the yes. word scholar the same as researcher. And it's not like a scholar has some like certificate next to their name. Right. Uh, I'm just talking about people who enjoy research and getting that research out there and discovering new topics. And again, we're mm -hmm. lucky in that we live in a world where publishing has changed and there's this new digital format of publishing, blogs, social media, online journals, because as, as amazing as um, like I'll say scholarly journals are, which are great peer reviewed journals. Uh, so you know that your peers have reviewed these, these uh, papers you're submitting and agree with your, uh, the, the way that you're conducting your research, your thesis, your analysis. I would say that in terms of making research inclusive, it's important to spread that research out and not just have those university or professional publication affiliated journals where one is submitting their research, but it's also having more front facing research such as on your personal blog. And we all know Instagram, um, you know, pros and cons, you can't fit a lot in. It is sometimes difficult to deal with challenging or complicated topics. So having a blog right. is something that's great uh, and, and checking yourself, you know, and making sure that you're upholding your own ethics and your own uh, scholarly endeavors. So just talking about the different places that 
any scholar, anyone who researches, who, who has that ethics behind the research can submit their, their work. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, maybe I, I'll talk. I do not mean to use an elitist word because I do not feel this way. No, at that's all. not what I meant yeah. because no, no, no. Oh, no, no I, I know. was not. It was I know, I've but been I'm thinking just about. saying that. Yeah, yeah, it's something that I've been no, thinking about absolutely. because I know I, I tend to uh, use the word curator and researcher and scholar interchangeably mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because I think that they are interchangeable to a certain extent. But I, I did want to make that point that this research and being a scholar, and anyone, anyone can be a scholar. I think anyone can mm -hmm. be a scholar with the Absolutely. correct intention, with, uh, with um, admirable uh, ways of research, making sure that you're ethically researching and uh, citing all Absolutely. your sources, right? Absolutely. Well, maybe I will start, start with another topic. Uh, Please. And we're, right? We, and we're, you had brought up, you know, this concept of kind of planting a flag on a topic or, or um, claiming a topic. And, you know, lots of people write about the same topic. I have been working on a Rudy Gernrich topic for a long time, and, and other people have too. And we all bring our own backgrounds and our own interests to these same topics. So what I'm going to be writing, uh, excuse me, speaking about an element of the, the Rudy Gernrich project, I'm really interested in expanding the narrative uh, from Rudy Gernrich to all the people he helped, excuse me, who helped him uh, become a famous designer. I think sometimes people become pigeonholed by the, that one one inch piece of fabric on the back of a garment with a famous name on it. But really <laughs> many hands went into making that, that one inch piece of fabric. So I will tell a, a bit of a personal story. I spend a lot of time in the Rudy Gernrich archive and um, over the years I've, you know, I've looked at different things. And a couple of years ago, I came across this, this hat and it is, looks kind of like a burlap fabric and it is actually trimmed with crocodile on it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, you know, I went, I'm dating all this stuff and I'm wondering, you know, what, what, what season this is in. And then I look and there is a label and it says mm -hmm. Leon Bennett on it. And I thought, well, who is Leon Bennett? And I even thought, is this a mistake? Did someone accidentally store the wrong hat in the Rudy Gernrich archive? Because the only other accessory designer I know who worked with Gernrich was Lane Nielsen, who worked from um, about basically 1964, 65, or 65 mm -hmm. on. So I was wondering, well, well, who is Leon Bennett? And that started my, my, my query. I was able to find the hat in a number of different sources. Here is Peggy Moffat, very young, mm -hmm. wearing the same model with a matching suit that is also trimmed with crocodile. I found out that it's, it's actually a, a hemp fabric. And hmm. I found other pieces uh, by Leon Bennett in the Fitham Museum's Rudy Gernrich archive, including this head drape, which is made out of mm. printed silk chiffon, and it was made to match a dress. And again, it wow. has the Leon Bennett label on it. Wow. Oh, okay, this is something, you know. So my questions were, obviously it's connected. My questions were, uh, who was Leon Bennett? What was his working process or collaboration like with Rudy Gernrick? And, and how did they meet? So I went to Google and I Googled Leon Bennett. This is the <laughs> truth. This is what, you know, people leave. This is, a, this is what research is nowadays. Um, the truth, but... the honesty here. I Googled his name and a few different things came up including an obituary from Variety uh, magazine, which is a kind of a Hollywood industry-based magazine uh, sure. from June 12, 2001. And it says, quote, Leon Bennett, who worked for many years as a hat designer. It's like, oh, I think this is the Leon Bennett I'm researching. <laughs> Your guy. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. A hat, a hat designer, a dresser, and a man Friday, which is kind of like an assistant um, for mm -hmm. actors such as Milton Berle, Jerry Lewis, and Sherman Helmsley. Died June 2nd of natural causes at a retirement home in Los Angeles. He was 85 and a long member of Motion Pictures Costume Local um, 7705. Oh. Then I decided to Google Leon Bennett and Rudy Gernreck, and a number of images popped up, um, including this image of Barbara Streisand from 1964, where Bennett mm. is given credit, along with Rudy Gernreck, for this hat, for this face shielding hat. So he was getting editorial credit. Then I wanted to know a bit more about him, and I went to the Ancestry.com, and I have all these like printouts that are printouts of different vital records, and mm -hmm. I, I found his Social Security Death Index notation for, mm -hmm. uh, for an R. Leon Bennett, who was born in 1916, who did pass away in 2001. So again, this is all lining up, and um, I think this is the correct Leon Bennett, because of course, well, there's a lot of people in the United States with the same name. Sure. I did find that 
I did find the same R. Leon Bennett, his, his uh, tomb at a Catholic cemetery here in Los Angeles. Okay. So I feel like, yes, I found that there's this, this, this person named Leon Bennett. And then I started uh, putting the name into different fashion databases, including Women's Wear Daily. And I found this um, image from Women's Wear Daily of Leon Bennett uh, with hat designs from uh, uh, 1963. And it states here that these hats are from his own collection, but he did design for Rudy Gernrich. He also designed for Bud Kilpatrick. So here it's, this is when I start to get excited about right. kind of amassing information about an individual that I did not know before. Right. He, uh, so he, I know, it's, I know it's a he now, he appeared in the pages of Ebony Magazine. He is given credit for um, this uh, headpiece here along with Rudy hmm. Gernrich. And I'm actually gonna try and read this. I printed it backwards for you, but I'm going to read it from the <laughs> back. So bear with me. Um, so this is the description for this, this hat here. It says, uh, black and camel re reversible coat and hat is another design by Rudy Gernrich. Um, Leon Bennett, a Negro milliner of California, created the headpiece, which is black felt. So he is being identified um, as black here. He, when you start looking, he mm -hmm. made it into the pages of many different magazines, including uh, Harper's Bazaar here. He made the, I'm sorry it cut it off, but it's a, a cute little cap made of plaid that matches the Rudy Gernrich coat here. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing that he's given credit uh, for the 1964 and one 1965 season along with Rudy Gernrich. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I love the headpiece too. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> things are really starting to add up, but you know, I still have questions and I mm -hmm. want, I, I would like to know more about the biography. Again, I start plugging information in and the 1940 census is available online. That is the latest census that is available. I think next year, very exciting. The 1950 census uh, will become available, but he does make it in the 1940 census. He was born in Oklahoma. Uh, he was single at that point and he was living in New Mexico. He was a butler. And I found uh, with, with other um, information, basically newspapers.com. Newspapers.com is great because it includes, I know this is your favorite and we're always talking about newspapers.com. <laughs> it includes a lot of local community newspapers that tend to focus on community activities there. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And so there are many, many articles of, of him talking about his fashion career. And <laughs> I found out that he was a graduate of the University of New Mexico he studied nutrition science and also public speaking. He began a hat business uh, in, in Colorado in 1940. I found out that his father was a caterer. And so father and son did work together as caterers. And there's a, a wonderful article where Leon Bennett describes how he started to make carved fruit hats. So centerpieces, large centerpieces made out of um, melon and fruit and apples and grapes and these wonderful hats that would be sitting at the center of the table. <laughs> His mom was later interviewed that he uh, started making hats at home uh, using chickens that, uh, using feathers that he plucked out of chickens, okay? Uh, so she was interviewed that with that as well. He also made his way to, so from um, that area, from Oklahoma and New Mexico, he, he seems to have made his way to Los Angeles by uh, the, the early 1950s. And uh, he worked at NBC in the wardrobe there, and that's where he met Milton Berle, other celebrities. He talked about being an extra in a film mm -hmm. called The Bellboy in 1960, which starred Jerry Lewis, and he was also an assistant for Jerry Lewis. And I wanna show you that I actually watched the film and I'm gonna try and, okay, so on the right side of the screen, the gentleman with the sunglasses um, and the long tie, that I believe, I believe that is um, Leon Bennett. So he made wow. an appearance in his um, empl employer's film. <laughs> I he, love it. Uh, he then, after the season of 19, about 1964, he seems to have parted ways with Rudy Gernrich. And I find advertisements for uh, hats at different stores in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. He also had a store uh, in, in Beverly Hills. So I, I found that I, I was able to kind of learn so much more about his life with all of these digitized uh, sources, but I still had questions. I still did not know tr truly how the two individuals had met. Turns out 
there was an extensive article in the California Daily Eagle, which was a black owned newspaper mm -hmm. meant for a black owned um, audience here in California. And it, it, it turns out that uh, he was interviewed for that and they met, Gernrich and he met on the set of, um, or in, in regards to a project for shoe makeup, which is spelled S-H-U, um, M-A-K up. And it was this type of, it's right here actually. It's this, this is an article, this is a, a um, ad from Vogue. And it's this paint that you can hmm. paint your shoes, making them uh, appropriate for any number of ensembles, kind of customizing them. And oh. he provided the hat for this and he talks about this and it is cut off here, but on the very top of this full page ad in Vogue is a little note, a little uh, caption that says, Hats by Leon of Beverly Hills. So now we know that this Hats by Leon of Beverly Hills is Leon Bennett, and we can we can really mm -hmm. create a fuller a fuller life um, through research for this person. Oh. But I still don't know what the working relationship was like between them, in part because I do not have the ability to interview Leon Bennett and have him tell his own story, which is what should happen. I was also right. unable to find. Uh, family members or friends who could tell me about their their family member, their community members. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the research falls short in not having uh, familial or community participation in my research. I, um, yeah, so that's, that's where the research falls short, but it was very exciting for me just as a researcher to be able to expand the narrative of my understanding of Rudy Gernrich, of, of someone who I never knew before. And you know what? All the information was absolutely out there, it was absolutely out there waiting to be found. And right. um, I, had, I had a great time it's researching just, it's that. A, it's, a, it's, it's a combination of factors. It's a combination of having the time to do this research, um, having the opportunity to go back through old research and say, oh wait, there's labels on these pieces. I, I'm not really familiar with this. So let me take some time. Um, and it, it is, it's just also sometimes you just are reading um, a book or a magazine, a period, you know, um, Vogue or uh, Amer to me, it's American Fabrics uh, and, and coming across a name that you're not quite familiar with mm -hmm. because you've heard, oh, you know, you go through a uh, fashion education, a fashion history education, and you've learned all of the designers, right? You have learned all of the French designers. Well, right, supposedly, right? The, the right, designers. and you have learned yeah. all of the <laughs> most important contributors to the canon of fashion. And you say, okay, I know everything now, or some people do. And then you start actually looking at Vogue or Harper's Bazaar or any other magazine for that period, and you're like, they were a lot more um, willing to give credit to a lot of different kinds of people in the industry at that point as well. I should yeah, point out, uh, yes. they were very free in crediting textile designers, which is uh, like my dream come true. Um, so you wouldn't see that in today's Vogue. You wouldn't see like, you know, mm. the dress is made by so-and-so, but the fabric was made by so-and-so. Um, and or the hat is, you know, a collaboration of these two people. So I feel like those those opportunities as we do research and those are the rabbit holes where you're like, I'm doing something right now that's focused on this, but I'm curious about that. I'm gonna go back to that. Um, that's the kind of thing that I'm now finding is more and more possible if you just have the time and inclination to look um, at these resources, newspapers, um, magazines, and to start scratching a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. And it's it's amazing. So my, my next, I mean, par, as part of this sort of examination of what American fashion designers uh, have done throughout the century, the 20th century, and probably also still today, um, in terms of adapting, borrowing, appropriating, misappropriating um, cultural material, um, I have come across in another volume of American Fabric, so I'm just going to step away for a second and show you. This is another one we have in the collection, but that I have a, a duplicate of at home. Um, another American Fabrics magazine. This one is from uh, about a little bit more than a decade later, 
and it's uh, fall winter 1966. And again, I have um, printed out some of the pages just because it's a little bit easier for me to show you. But I came across this this um, article um, just, I don't know, randomly, I suppose. I don't remember if I was particularly researching anything. I just, I read these things just for fun. Um, and if there's a whole, a whole article about African prints, prints from the new Africa. And what this, reading this article taught me is first of all, it's, it's the tone of this article is entirely different than, um, let's say the tone around describing things that are exotic or, um, um, you know, oh, how wonderful it is that so-and-so went here and discovered this amazing thing and they brought it back and reinterpreted it. Well, actually, um, this is a lot about actual African fabrics and African, African, um, it, it, the, dis the description of the different kinds of techniques that are um, used for African fashions. And then also how it can be adaptable and uh, um, inspirational for American designers. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a dual edge to it. There is um, an aspect of documentarianism and there's also um, how how people in the industry can be um, inspired. So they they call out different kinds of, of fabrics like uh, bark cloths and and how they're made. So there's there is a, a level of education to this to the spread. Mm -hmm. um, but what really also drew so that we have the woodblock conga print. So conga is a um, a rectangular square cloth uh, that is usually worn in pairs by women in, in West, uh, Eastern Africa, excuse me. And what American fashion designers were actually doing with these textiles. So here is um, a, a jumpsuit made out of a conga and it's by a designer named Hazel Blackman, who was a Jamaican born woman uh, from the African diaspora who wound up in New York and opened her own shop called the tree house. Hmm. Um, and, you know, looking for her in fashion literature has been, um, you know, very difficult. There, there have been a couple of articles that I have found that focus on her and also another designer who is featured um, as well, I'm not sure she's featured actually in this spread, but um, this is mostly focused on Hazel Blackman. And there's no picture of Hazel here, but there is lots of pictures of her work. And this is just the kind of thing that stops me in my tracks because I look at it and I love it. I would want to wear it, but I also understand that there's so much more, there's so much more deeply embedded in this story that I, I need to explore. Um, she was really bold in her choices. Um, the conga here, you can actually see still part of the um, Kiswahili um, proverbs. They're usually mm -hmm. um, part of the the whole gar the whole garment, this rectangular square of cloth that you know they have good fortune or they have just cu cultural sayings. And I love that it's not taken away out of these designs. It's part of the design. Even mm -hmm. if this person who is a white woman doesn't understand it, does she does she need to understand it? That's mm -hmm. that's my question is how how are our people re receiving this as a as only a style or as something more culturally significant? I'm sure that the intention to use the full cloth is something that speaks to this moment in time, which is the Afrocentrism that is starting to pervade American culture. And so I am my next research project um, rega with regards to this. The other, well, look, that's a side, to side topic. Um, oh, let me show you some color images. Yeah. yeah. 
Lee, did she leave right. any interviews? Are, are there interviews with her? Not or? that I've found yet. There are, there are uh -huh. some small quotations, but for example, here is, here she is, here is Hazel. This is from the 19, 19, September 1966 volume of Ebony. So I, I tracked this down and added it to my collection um, as it pertains to research I'm doing personally, but also I'm hoping that we are going to um, make some acquisitions based on some of the research that I've done re with regards to congas and their use in fashion, especially in this period. So this is a great um, example here, for example, here is Cher, just, just pointing Cher out. Uh, and it, this is actually another um, fashion designer from Los Angeles, uh, Sadie Hayes. So sometimes one researching one person in particular starts to cascade into the research around, oh my gosh, I didn't know half of the people, or actually no, I didn't know any of the people in this article. Um, but now there's there's a richer yeah. way to look at this. And first of all, here's the color image of that amazing wow. manga jumpsuit. Wow. Um, yeah, and share. So that mm -hmm. so you find out also who patrons were for people. Um, this is actually another um, project of mine, Cheryl Nero, who was a textile and fashion designer who went on to found the Bed Bedford Stuyvesant Design Works. Um, which was all, well, which was also sort of an initiative that was um, advanced by Jacqueline Kennedy and um, led with knowledge and generosity by uh, Dee Dee and Leslie Tillett, who are American uh, fabric royalty. <laughs> They're a household name in my house anyway, <laughs> but they should be a household <laughs> name everywhere. Um, and here's another fashion designer. I don't think I'll have time to talk about her much today, but another time, because I'm still doing my research, this is Khadijah, who at the same moment as Hazel Blackman was opening her own boutique, she also, um, she's still alive, so I am going to track her down and have a conversation with her if she's willing. Oh, good. Um, uh, yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, she did leave this country. She went to Canada. She was a textile designer, a fashion designer, accessories designer. Um, really, there are so many rich stories to find out about. And I, I'm, what I'm also really excited about and I, I, I'm not sure that I'm the first person to think about this this way, and I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out more. Um, I, I really think that that moment in time in the 60s with Afrocentric, um, Af Black is Beautiful and Kwame Brothwaite and the Grandasa models and this real embrace of actual African fabric in American culture, I'd like to start thinking about African fabrics as an American fabric, um, that it does permeate it's not it's not pervasive to the extent that it replaces all other ideas and designs but it becomes this groundswell of appreciation for african materials um and i'm just i'm really excited to think about how these fabrics which have a very um a very circuitous history in and of themselves mm -hmm. um you know the especially the, the dutch african prints the wax prints which are <laughs> truly based on Indonesian batik that got cycled through colonialism into the Netherlands and into Africa as a way to sell um, a product that the Indonesians actually did, rejected. Um, but the mm -hmm. Africans, uh, uh, mostly West Africans and the gold, what they called the Gold Coast, um, they started to have more input because they were interfacing with their clients for cloth more than others. So they started to have more agency in the kinds of designs yeah. that were being produced in Africa eventually and also in the Netherlands. Um, so I just really, I'm excited to, to delve into the historical um, aspects of cloth trade and then bring it up to the 60s and then also again in the 90s when you start right. to see another fluorescence of um, African, Af Africana, if you, if you will, um, a lot of hip hop artists and um, uh, people like uh, Queen Latifah really embrace African style and um, certain he head headdresses and then the fabrics. Some of them were probably imported and mm -hmm then you have to reckon with the fact that American manufacturers are pretty savvy. 
and they see trends like they would be put forth in, in American fabrics. And there are a lot of African inspired fabrics that are American made um, that enter the, the popular mm -hmm. culture as well. So I'm, I'm interested in, in doing a little bit of, of research and also acquisitions um, around um, Afrocentric fashions and how they fit into the larger picture of fashion. Because I think sometimes, um, like for example, there were a lot of commercial patterns that were available. Um, Essence manu uh, put out a line of, of, of African inspired uh, commercial patterns for sewing and um, so did Butterex and McCall's and they all they were all recognized a, a, I guess a sellable a saleable moment and that there was a need for this and that it wasn't necessarily going to be found in department stores or at the high echelons of fashion so you had to make it yourself and I'm really interested in this idea of um, of of people deciding to identify themselves in a particular way and also taking it into their own hands and, and creating those fashions. And sometimes those fashions were made out of sheets and mm. sometimes they were made out of real African fabrics. And sometimes they are made um, out of, of American, you know, imitations. So I'm, I'm going to try to suss all that out and add and, and, and do my part. I'm not going to be the leader, but do my part to, represent the American fashion and textile um, scene in a slightly different way than um, has I've than I've come across in in, in the the very um, western centric mm -hmm. uh, fashion history that I've been taught yeah we were just talking about this uh, concept of the patterns uh, just last mm -hmm. night and I'm most interested yeah. in the agency of the individuals who would use those patterns and and really self create for themselves yeah. um, according to their own cultural backgrounds you know um, yes it's just it's it's such a, a huge topic to be able to discuss and it does also um, you know, it's it's so it's so modern right these are 1990s patterns they're still available we can find yeah. them on eBay uh, yep. and just a wonderful material cultural analysis I, I feel is waiting for that for that yeah mm -hmm. so thanks and I, I I can't wait to you know hopefully hopefully Khadija will I don't know if she's watching but I would love <laughs> to talk to her um Hazel Blackman has passed away so I can't do that but I also would really like to um figure out ways to engage in community dialogue about what was what was it like for you in the 90s? How did mm -hmm. your look come about? I don't I'm not and I, I will admit I'm not really sure how to start that part of my research. I right. admit it. I, I'm not really sure right. where to go. I don't know if I put a call out on Instagram on my personal account saying, did you make your own Afrocentric fashions in the 90s? I would love to hear from you. Be part of an oral history project. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's would be a way to start. But I could also, you know, turn to for example, T.J. Walker, who's on our staff at FITM, um, who founded Cross Colors. Yes. I know that that was certainly a brand that is about promoting that Afrocentrism um, in, a, in a more hip hop way. But I, I'm sure that he might have some resources for me, like people that I could talk to who either sourced fabrics for him or, um, or that he knows people who did their own thing. And I'm, I'm really interested to explore that. Yeah, I think every individual is different when we're doing these oral histories and we meet that individual where they, um, in terms of how much they would like to participate or in what right. way. And every relationship is different when we start um, meeting people. Yeah. Right, right. Um, I just I just saw that we do have a few questions. So I'm going oh, to try to... Oh, do we? Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I there's like a new little ones. thing where it shows, it shows we them have, on the We side. have two minutes also. So. Okay, <laughs> well, it was a question about Leon Bennett and how, how early did designers start putting their name, their tags in garments and, and accessories like that. So I'm not sure okay, we're going to have well, all the time in the world to answer that. I just didn't notice it until now. I'm so sorry. But you had written a very nice blog post about Leon Bennett as well. Yeah, I, I was speaking from my blog post. It's a two-page blog post uh, that is on our newly designed website, thanks to my coworker, Joanna Abijaude. Mm -hmm. So I hope those of you who are watching can check out um, the website and the blog. And in terms of seeing labels in garments, when you're talking about garments from um, Europe and the United States, that would be about the mid-19th century. Uh, that you start seeing labels of either department stores or individual designers' names. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Well, and if you all want to know a little bit more about Leon Bennett, um, head to our uh, newly designed website, re newly redesigned website, and you can find Christina's extensive research on Leon Bennett there. And stay tuned to that space for other um, more, more research topics. topics. For more, more research topics. More research and topics. And we want, that, yeah, yeah, related we, to what we talked about today and others. So. Thank you everyone for joining us here today with our honest conversation about all the research topics we're, we are engaged with and reparative scholarship. And we'll look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you uh, in the future. Thank you so Have much, Christine. It was a pleasure as usual. And um, for our audience, thank you so much for tuning in and caring what we do at the Fitta Museum. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Bye.